OK, today I would like to introduce modular Linux. Um, first of all, I would normally ask something like, how many of us have used Linux, when in fact, Everyone here has used Linux. If you've been on the internet or if you've used an Android phone, you have interacted with Linux directly or in indirectly. You probably haven't directly associated yourself with the command line or used any Linux commands, but if you've been on the internet, you've had to go to servers which were most likely powered by Linux. Very many things which are connected to the internet and very many things which drive technology we use are powered by Linux. Now, why is this and what exactly makes it so powerful? So first we can begin to look at what is Linux. Linux is a kernel. Linux is not necessarily an operating system in itself. The, a kernel, and in this case written mostly in assembly in C, um, is the foundation for building an operating system because it actually connects to the hardware of a computer or something that it's running on. We actually, in order to have an operating system, these are the things which we actually interact with on our device. The kernel actually manages calls to the hardware. So if we want to do something with a CPU, a graphics processor, or something like that, that call ends up going through a kernel. The kernel is monolithic. It's code that we probably won't ever need to access or modify ourselves. Um, the kernel is essential for using Linux. And even though we refer to things as Linux, Linux is more of a family of operating systems that happen to use this kernel. Oh, and. Uh, Shown at the left of the screen is Linus Trevalds uh, addressing NVIDIA. <laughs> uh, why use Linux? You probably already do, as we've covered, but there are a few reasons. First of all, it's free, not just in price, but in freedom. All of Linux is effectively open source. This means that the code of the operating system and the kernel is available for us to modify. If we look at Windows or OS X, or uh, Mac OS, excuse me, um, the code is very much pri proprietary, and rather than being able to modify our operating system, what we're only able to do is basically attempt to overwrite certain operating system functions. If we want to replace a component of Windows, we don't remove that. We install something else that we choose to use instead. But this is a very bloated way to use an operating system. It's very powerful because with this open source structure, we're able to effectively use the operating system for whatever we want and have complete control over it. And lastly, it's fun because using free software, using open source software, allows us to create a user environment exactly as we want it to be. So how do we actually use Linux? Using Linux in a desktop environment is pretty much used by installing it in a distribution. Of course, we also use it in many integrated platforms where we don't necessarily notice that. That would be like Android, servers, anything where we don't necessarily have direct access. If we want to install Linux, we don't just download the kernel. We look for another operating system, a complete operating system or distribution built around this kernel. There are many different distributions available for different purposes. And choosing one comes down to what you need to do with that. We'll have, we'll have a little bit of a look later on at different distributions we can use and the reasons why we might choose those. So a distro is a Linux distribution. It includes the Linux kernel, and it includes what would be called core utilities, or in this case, the GNU core utils. These are actual calls which we can process through a kernel. Um, these might be things like ls, which lists files, rm, which removes files, very essential low-level file system functions. For instance, when you're able to remove, add, create a directory or file, all of these calls are essentially processed into these low-level functions on the operating system. These might be done with a graphical interface, a program, something which automatically creates files, but all of this essentially boils down into these core utilities of a Linux system. All Linux distributions will generally have these core utilities. Um, so in effect, using Linux actually represents very much using GNU slash Linux, as Richard Stallman refers to it, who founded the GNU project. I believe this is significant because the GNU project represents a ton of essential core utilities which make up what we consider a Linux operating system. When calls to CPUs and other different low-level hardware aren't necessarily something that we use very frequently when using Linux as a user. So how do we install Linux? One option is in a virtual machine. This impersonates real hardware and can create an environment where something can access memory, 
CPU power, and all the other functions of hardware through another operating system. Of course, Linux and GNU are full-featured operating systems, and in a distribution, we can treat it just like Windows or Mac OS. We can burn it to a disk or something which we can boot from, which is not necessarily our device drive, so something that we can reboot, load from that, and install or even just live boot a Linux distribution through that. So to use Linux on a desktop, it's effectively like any other operating system. The graphical environment is very familiar, and there are indeed operating systems or distributions which specifically go out of their way in order to create an environment which is very similar to Windows or Mac OS. The power is in the modular configuration. The fact that while it can be very similar to Windows and we don't necessarily have to touch code, that we can choose to do that and choose what modules or what different Linux powers we choose to use. Every component is Linux, in Linux is assigned to a package. We use package management to add or remove different packages. So if we don't like, for example, our file man manager, our taskbar, our web browser, rather than simply installing another or even attempting to overwrite another, we can remove and replace these components as we choose. So beyond the kernel, as mentioned, Linux is divided into these packages. These packages are of a large variety, and we can manage them either from a command line or from a graphical interface to a package manager. In the example of Ubuntu, we use apt-get. So in this case, sudo, which is to act as a super user, apt-get, which is the apt-get package function, install, which will search for the function, wmaker or window maker. Um, this string will essentially install a new package, which will immediately become integrated into the operating system and be able to be called by its name. So what is the shell? The shell is an essential function of Linux because it is what allows us to directly call operating system components. Uh, most distros include bash or the born again shell named after uh, by Linus Trevalds based on the original born shell. Although you can install any shell you choose which may have their own different variety in the way commands are used such as fish, zish, which are customizable as once again all of these elements are open source. So the shell allows users to directly call programs. And shell scripting allows for the automation of OS functions by calling different programs and using them in multiple ways. So here's an example of Linux shells in use by a real hacker. Well, maybe not. Of course, these are all real Linux utilities, and they're divided into different terminal windows. And each of these are directly called from a shell or command line. With that in mind, they're not really doing particularly much. There is some real code at the lower right and a process monitor at the upper left of the screen. And all of these are useful shell functions, but the rest are mostly for visual decoration. So commands each have their own input or output. They're linked together doing, using different redirection operations. The first command, the horizontal bar or pipe, sends the input of one command from standard uh, in, or excuse me, from standard output to the next as standard input. If one program returns foo, then the next will also interpret that as foo. Each thing which is printed will be used as an argument for the next, which is forwarded to the next process. We can also use different operations, such as the greater than symbol, which will send out output to a file, or use that twice in order to append output to a file, which means that the output of the previous program will be sent to the end of the file rather than simply creating a new file. Scripts can also uh, use various programming functions like variables, um, functions, traditional programming techniques, which can assign if statements and use very much regular programming functions in conjunction with calling operating system components. So to write a shell script, first of all, we declare it as a shell script. This is using the crunch bang and then slash bin and slash bash. This declares that the script should use the bash shell, which is located in the slash bin directory. We can write a basic shell script with just a few different functions. ls lists various files from within the current directory. In this case, we're in a home directory, so there will be folders like documents, pictures, and so on. We can pipe this output such that it is used by input as for grep, which then searches for any file names which were found with ls and looks for ones which happen to contain the string doc or doc. We send the output of this file to doc.txt. 
So ls lists the files, grep searches for doc, and then finally the output is sent to doc.txt. We can do this as a single string on the command line, or we can save it as a script and run it when we choose to. We can also check the input using a program like cat and see that indeed documents is one of the folders which included the, the string doc, and as such was received as the output which was sent to doc.txt. Here we can see a much more complicated example of a script. It begins with the same crunch bang bin bash declaration. And we have an if statement, another if statement based on a different user input, and a third if statement based on a different user input. Now, these if statements are very much in a similar syntax that might be found in Python or other various programming languages. However, the things done within them are actually calls to OS operating system modules. One of these, for example, is cat, which concatenates files or views them, um, cut, which divides strings based on various delimiters, rm, which removes a file, ls. All of these are functions which we would use on their own when using a Linux operating system from the command line. But we can link all of these together into a long script. Can I ask you a question? Later. Is this another version of a computer language or just one of the... Like, Good question. Is Bash necessarily a computer language? Yes. Uh, Bash scripting or shell scripting generally has its own syntax, which is very clearly declined, uh, or de very clearly declared, rather. And as such, we can follow these. But the difference is that rather than necessarily calling a module within a programming language, when we write a shell script, we call an operating system module. So rather than in Python, where we might use a module which echoes something back, we actually call a program within our Linux operating system that does that echo instead for us. And that could be called from the command line or within a script. Uh, same goes for ls. We might use ls to list files in a directory we're in, or we might use it to develop some sort of input for a shell script. So linking these, so the power isn't being able to link together Linux's different modules. So command input and output are linked together in shell scripts. All right, come on. forward. Yeah. Okay. So with these different uh, shell scripts, we can also reference different points of the Linux environment. So obviously we have our hardware and our kernel, and the things after that are largely up to us. And while it might be unlikely that you're going to necessarily modify your Linux kernel directly, everything above this on this stack is very useful for a user to be able to manipulate. A display server, well, there are only a few choices, such as X and Wayland, but these actually render our user environment. A graphical interface will render how we like our graphical environment to appear. And finally, that will reach the user. Um, so all of these elements are, so we, we can see the different examples of each of these, and that we can choose these ourselves and basically create any sort of user environment that we like. This is very different to a traditional Windows or Mac OS stack, where all of these things are pretty much set in stone and either very difficult to modify for the user or need to be overwritten or almost spoofed from a user point of view. So here's an example of my own Linux environment and how I define it. We have our X window system, which of course manages graphical rendering. I have an X in RC file, which it shows what my X server initializes. In this case, I'm using OpenBox to show my graphical environment. And I execute my window manager with exec openbox session in my exit RC. So when I start my window system, I also start that. And within that, it links to another file in which I've configured a number of things which I like. A compositor, which allows transparency and uh, allows my desktop environment to render as I like. Tint2, which is a menu bar. A script I wrote myself, which chooses a desktop background. A volume icon, a network manager, a power manager, a device monitor, and finally, a script to allow window tiling. So as we can see here, rather than Windows where each of these things, are, or traditional operating systems, where each of these things may be represented within a closed source proprietary environment, each of the things which in my desktop environment have been selected by me and are triggered by a number of events. Thunar is my uh, file manager. I use XFC4 for my terminal emulator. Fay sets my desktop background 
and Tint2 renders the menu bar at the top of the screen. Each of these modules can be changed or manipulated. And of course, while this is shown at a very user level graphical environment, this extends all the way to a server or something much more significant, which could include many packages being tied together. The power in Linux is that each of these things are able to be replaced and configured and without taking up additional space. So, any component of the operating system can be isolated, manipulated, and customized. It can be replaced, it can be removed, and it isn't tied necessarily to a full operating system stack. And this open source setup means we have an infinite level of control. Even if we can't find a particular module or component of Linux which we like, we can write that ourselves or manipulate ourselves. So some distros or distributions are available uh, pre-configured. They'll have web browsers, file managers, office suites, pretty much everything that we could expect from a standard Windows or Mac OS environment, perhaps with even more, as many operating systems don't include WordPress, word processors or complete office suites, or things which we usually want and have to install ourselves. We can also choose desktop environments, which show how our actual operating system is rendered. Some distros, though, such as Arch and Gentoo, Gentoo and Slackware, um, come with nothing but basically shell and configuration files. Everything the user decides to add to their operating systems, besides the bare essentials above the kernel, is pretty much entirely up to the user, which means a fully functional desktop environment could have less than 300 or so programs, which may sound like a lot in Windows terms, where all of those would be almost compressed into a single unit. But this absolute uh, lightness, which is possible, means that a full operating system environment can exist in just a few hundred megabytes of memory or, or even less. While the installation process of these operating systems is much more difficult, it allows us insight into how Linux actually works and how it is built. So we can also personalize it to exactly how, our want, how we want our operating system to work without any bloat. So any distro can be used with different software. Um, desktop environments, terminal engineers, file engineers, and other operating system tools. Whether your distro is pre-configured or whether you have to install it yourself, any of these can be manipulated. So here's an example of a very sci-fi looking desktop environment. Now this is a very actually this is a real Linux desktop environment. This is something which somebody is actually using. And each of these calls is, are to a specific module or unit. Can you, can you? So as written out here, while these are just simple labels, each one of these modules is a call to a specific program. What looks like a very sci-fi environment is actually represented by modules, uh, desktop or window manager, and other different modules which can be broken down such that we can define our user environment to exactly how we like it. As such, a hacker might define their environment to look exactly as they wish. Or a graphic designer who may appreciate different uh, graphical environments can actually create those themselves. So rather than this, which looks very much like a render, this is the operating system as it exists, as it is called. Um, these environments are real and actually able to be defined by the user with complete control. So in summary, while Linux is just a kernel, it can be combined to make much more than that. And this can be used to personalize our graphical user environment, how we use our computer, how we use a server, how we host a server. And from top to bottom, we can basically customize Linux, which is where, it, where its power actually lies. The fact that every part of Linux is separated, available to us to be customized, and available to us to choose from another of open source op options means that Linux can be whatever we want it to be. Linux is extremely extensible. We can use it for whatever we want. And when learned, it means that we can create much better environments for ourselves to use. As such, I think that learning Linux is very valuable within computer science and can also be a lot of fun. All right, hopefully you learned a little bit about Linux and are motivated to use it now. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Ian.